Hello, Namaste. Welcome to Dave's Hammer Cell. This is the weekly flagship uh, English talk show of ITV Nepal and Indigenous Television. In this weekly talk show, I invite guests from different countries and I try to discuss on various contemporary issues uh, affecting Indigenous peoples and I try to connect the lesson learned, experiences, and struggles with one another. In this talk show, I sometimes conduct face-to-face -face interviews, sometimes, sometimes I conduct online video conferences, and uh, discuss on various contemporary issues affecting indigenous peoples. Today, I'm going to discuss about the music and uh, its role in the society because indigenous peoples in the world are rich in terms of the music. In order to discuss about uh, this topic, about the music, I have invited very renowned guest. Uh, her name is Kesendra Balosa Bardin. She was born and raised in France, and uh, she is now a senior lecturer in music at the University of Lincoln in UK. And she is a prolific uh, performer in many different kinds of traditions. And, and she has performed at uh, many festivals and venues, including in the BBC Festival, Folk Festival, held in uh, many different places in the UK, Italy, France, in Africa, and so forth. She herself has uh, studied uh, the musicology and uh, specializing on ethnomusicology also has presented at a number of uh, national as well as international conferences. Her research areas include uh, musical instrument, instrument making, instrument revival, inter intercultural music making, more importantly, the bagpipe and applied ethnomusicology. And, uh, Interestingly, she has founded uh, the uh, first and only international bagpipe um, organizations. And she herself runs a podcast, radio podcast, on bagpipe called Bagpipe Galore. And I have talked to her uh, about the music and its role in the society. Uh, Cassandra, uh, first of all, welcome to the show. Yes, absolutely, and thank you for having me. Uh, to start with our conversations, uh, Cassandra, could you please introduce uh, about yourself and your involvement with the music and teaching of the music at the university? My name's uh, Cassandra Velosse Bardin, and I am a musician. I play mainly wind instruments. So I play a selection of recorders and bagpipes. I am also the director of the International Bagpipe Organization. So we organize events every two years, big conferences where we get um, people who play bagpipes, but also who research bagpipes to uh, come together and, and, and talk. And I also teach at the University of Lincoln. I'm a senior lecturer in music there, where I teach about uh, traditional music, music from around the world, but also um, about the music industries. And I also um, lead the, the folk band in the university. So a little bit of everything, really. I still recall the moment uh, for the first time that we had made in UNESCO headquarters in Paris, uh, France. I guess uh, you had not involved in the music then, uh, right? Or had you played the music then, uh, previously? Yeah, I was already a professional musician back then. Um, what, what I hadn't started was my PhD. So then after that, I went to the UK and I started my PhD in ethnomusicology. Um, but yes, I've been playing since I'm five years old. And um, from the age of 17, I've been professional playing um, just concerts around either first classical music and then more and more involved in traditional music. You said that you specialized on the ethnomusicology. Uh, what does a ethnomusicology stand for and how this ethnomusicology is connected with the ethnic minorities or the indigenous communities? So eth Ethnomusicology is, as you as you see, like the combination between ethnology or anthropology and music, which means basically looking at music within culture, within um, within society. So it's more of a methodology rather than 
um, studying a specific kind of music. But a lot of people who study ethnomusicology are very interested in looking at people, um, in, in looking at music that has a lot of meaning for people, a lot of cultural meaning. And that means that often, uh, well, many times people are looking at traditional forms of music. And that's also what I did. I was looking at music from uh, the island of Mallorca, which is a small island um, just west of Spain where they have a very strong um, identity, very strong culture, and where they play their own music, which which is, of course, you know, it's akin to other musics around, but it's very much their own music, and it has a very strong importance for their culture, for their identity as people, and they involve it in, it's politicised as well, all these kind of different elements. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what ethnomusicology would be, looking at how... Uh, music is used in different ways by people to create culture and meaning. Currently, many uh, young people nowadays are interested to listen and uh, play uh, Western music uh, such as drums, piano and so forth. But you, uh, being a Westerner, uh, you're uh, still interested in ethnomusicology and uh, classical music. So I want to know uh, actually what motivated you to study in such uh, areas, especially the uh, ethnomusicology? Well, I, I, I started off doing classical music. So since I'm five years old, I've been doing classical music um, because that was only what was available. Where I lived, there was not really any traditional music. Um, so I just did everything in the classical music. And then um, when I was 13, I discovered the bagpipes by accident when I went to Spain to learn the language. And then fell in love and uh, decided to save all my pocket money to buy a, a, pair, a set of bagpipes when I was 18. So I saved for five years. And during that time, I was starting to look at the music that was related to that and found that the music was really very alive in a way that I didn't find in conservatoires, uh, in classical music. Um, so when I was when I was 18 and I, I managed to get a small group traveling and I took these with me and started really looking at traditional music in Spain, in Galicia more specifically, and um, really started understanding what it meant to be part of a traditional culture with the dancing, with the food, with the music, with everything that was around it, and, and just never looked back really. So I, I completed the conservatoire, but when I was there I was also looking at the conservatoire and saying, right, for my final theory degree, I want to look present of folk music and then I can't do that. It's got to be Schumann, Schubert. And and I didn't like that. So I finished it and then after that I went to ethnomusicology, which I discovered at the university um with some of my teachers, lecturers, and then never looked back, just thought this is what I want to do. And I think that over the last yeah, 10, 15 years it's been really nourishing. And it's also fed me as a musician, learning with other musicians to play different kinds of music. I've become a better musician, um, even after having done all the formal classical training. Cassandra, you have performed in a number of musical festivals, and now you are invited by uh, big media houses as well, including BBC and other radios to play and perform music. You are now music celebrities, uh, and how do you feel yourself when you look back to your struggle period and a now well-established musician? Uh, very proud, actually. Um, we were there on Saturday, uh, actually, with my, with my Italian band. Um, and I remember the first time I was invited, it was about five, six years ago, um, with six years ago with, with another formation. And I remember, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that I'd managed to get invited uh, to play. And yeah, I felt very proud because I was invited playing this kind of music, this traditional music, the music that I love. Um, and so it was a, a really a great achievement. And then also playing at the festivals that in my head were the festivals that were the the most important ones for me, where all this music, these traditional music, these groups from around the world come and play. Um, WOMAD is one of them. So having played there and, and being part of this network now is, is kind of a dream come true. So I'm, I must say, it's, I'm, I feel very, very lucky.
to be doing what I'm doing these days. Kesendra, uh, I also want to know about your family background uh, a bit. Uh, did you grow up listening music played uh, by any of your family members or um, you are the only one playing music in your family? And actually, how did you grow up your interest in to, uh, music? Um, no, my parents know nothing about music. Nothing. Not the first thing. My, my father doesn't even recognize happy birthday unless you have the words with them. So that tells you what they are. However, my parents are artists. Um, they draw, they paint, um, and they wanted their, their children to, to learn about music. Um, so they, you know, they had small children, they put them in music school, and they never expected that two of their children would become professional musicians. Um, out of with three. One of them became an artist and the two others became musicians, including me. So they never expected this. They just let us get on with it. And that maybe was the trick that they never, they weren't strict with music. They didn't say you need to sit down, you need to practice. Actually, they did do that with piano. And I, and I can't play the piano. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> but um, yeah, they were very, they were, they were just let us get on with it. And and it was the best thing. And then they just let us discover. The, the only difficult thing was with that was that sometimes I remembered listening to something thinking, I love that. And then not knowing what it was, not knowing how to find it. Of course, there wasn't the internet back then. So, and then it took me, sometimes it took me 10 years to know, oh, that's what I heard. This is what I like. Um, because it wasn't around all the time and they were unable to tell me, of course. Um, so that was that was interesting. So it's a real journey, and um, yeah, they just they they're just very proud. They just let us get on with it, and I think that that's the best thing. The the one thing I will say is that I have noticed that people who do have parents in the music world, they have a lot of networks already set up, and and I do notice um, my first tour was when I was twenty six, but I know that people. Um, who are 18, 19, or already doing these kind of things because their parents are in the industry. So it took me a bit longer, but I'm very proud because I know that everything that's happened is down to my work, really, and, and how, I've, how I've just done things, and I, I don't think I'd do it any other way today. So yeah, no, no music at all, but a very artistic environment. We have talked a lot about the music and now, uh, if you don't mind, um, we would like to listen some samples of your music. Uh, what would you want to play for us, uh, please? Well, I've got a few of my instruments here and I think I'll start with this one. This is a recorder made out of wild cherry tree and it was made by my little sister. I mean, uh, she's only two years younger. She's a big, big person now. Um, and um, this is... Uh, I, I've been playing on this one for nearly 20 years now, um, which is a long lifestyle, life um, expectancy for a recorder, but it's my favourite. And what I'm going to play is, uh, so I'm French, despite my English accent, and I'm going to play uh, some a, a tune that spans over Britain and the UK. This was a tune written by um, a British musician, Andy Cutting, and it's about a... Uh, festival in France and this was on the way back they wrote this and it's a waltz so one of my favorite dances to dance so this is called Flat World
Wow, what a nice tune you played. Uh, I still remember uh, the moment, uh, as I said earlier as well, uh, that uh, you took me to visit some club in Paris uh, where um, you yourself played a bagpipe. Uh, and you played well uh, back in 2010. And if you don't mind, could you play a sample of bagpipe uh, for my viewers as well, if you have a bagpipe right now? Yeah, I have one here with me. Wow. To play you a tune later. Um, this is a bagpipe from um, the southwestern part of France, so the Bourg. It's not my first bagpipe. My first bagpipe, it's, it's in the morning here, and the first bagpipe that I have is very loud, so I thought maybe not the best for the neighbours. Um, but this one is a very sweet-sounding one. Um, would you like me to play it now or would you like me to... Yes, okay. Um, so what I'm going to play is another waltz actually. Um, it's a little bit unfortunate, but never mind. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Cassandra, uh, for uh, playing amazing uh, music, uh, especially the bagpipe. And I still uh, remember, or I, I see, happen to see that our Nepali community as well, uh, especially who are recruited in British Army, also uh, play a bagpipe. And I have listened to them playing bagpipe and carrying bagpipe. The tune and instrument they have uh, carried are uh, look different. Are there differences in terms of occasions uh, in playing a bagpipe um, and uh, the specialties and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. So the bagpipe is a really old instrument. I think the first named bagpiper was Emperor Nero 2000 years ago in the Roman Empire. Um, but it might even have existed before. There is speculation that the bagpipe might come from the Middle East. It's a really interesting instrument. It's an Indo-European in instrument which goes from Rajasthan all the way to Ireland. And all of these places have their own indigenous or vernacular instruments. Um, and so it's, it's really, you know, the Indo-European instrument. Um, it maps really well onto the language map. And so what's really interesting with the bagpipes is that they've, they're all very specific to a culture and to a region, and often sometimes to even a smaller area. Um, and they're, because they're all very different, the repertoire is all adapted to that bagpipe. Um, so, for example, this bagpipe will have a specific repertoire. I can maybe play it on another one, but not necessarily, because they will all be a little bit different, and they will all mean something slightly different in the different cultures that they're played in. 
of course, they're, they're a lot related to dance and to celebration and to all of these different elements, but they've also taken other meanings where, for example, some people are fighting for their language or some people are fighting for certain kind of land rights and, and this instrument will appear and will symbolise the land, the people, the culture. Um, and so it's really important that these instruments continue to be played and, and remain alive, not just something in a museum that you can see. Um, I I'm, I'm think that in Nepal there are some people who play the bagpipes, um, but they will be playing probably the version of the Scottish Highland bagpipes, which will be brought over by um, by the, the British Empire. Um, but what, what's really interesting is that I don't know if in Nepal there used to be a vernacular form of bagpipe, that I, I'm not sure about. No, there wasn't. But what's really interesting is that people have taken the instrument and they've um, adapted it for their own needs. Um, they've adapted slightly the costume. They've adapted also how how you um, you play it, in what circumstances you play it. And I've seen examples, for example, in um, in northern India, where where it's it's played in a completely different way than it would in Scotland, and the repertoire has been completely changed um, because it's you having a completely different function than what it would do in Scotland, for example. Um, and that that is declined all throughout different areas where they've been embedded in the local culture, in the local society and become a, a form of traditional music in weddings and everything, uh, or celebrations or festivities in, in whichever way um, they're being used. It, it's, declined. So it's a really fascinating instrument that's very different um, and, has, and has very different um, forms of being, very different sounds, um, but all really are very linked to um, the people and to the traditions that they have. So it, it's a bit of a broad uh, brush, um, but yeah, that's, that's the instrument really. You have really brought a good topic for discussion, uh, especially how music can be used to defend the rights or um, uh, to ensure the identity. Uh, indigenous peoples around the world are rich uh, in terms of music. Um, could you please share your experiences how uh, the music can, uh, how indigenous peoples can best use their music to promote their tradition as well as uh, to fight for their rights? I think it will depend depending on what people need and de depending on what people want. Um, but I think the first thing that, and, and probably most people know this, but the first thing that we need is to transmit, to make sure that it doesn't get lost, um, to, to make sure that the next generation knows what they're playing, knows what they're knows what what the music is and knows the stories that go with it as well just having you know just having the notes isn't enough having the whole the whole element the whole stories around it um is necessary so that um it the importance of the music is understood not just the music itself and then and then from there it really depends what people want to do with it so i i've i've seen some examples of people for example um modernizing the music and putting it on stages putting it on festivals and and creating awareness like that like um widening the the public the audience for the music and that means that people might get interested in that culture and think oh who are they what what is what is um happening um how how does this work or um either and this could be either a home audience for people at home or it could be a, an outside audience um so for example in in uh, Northern Australia, for example, they have a, a local festival um, where Indigenous people come together and perform with all their bands. And that is a platform that enables younger bands also to play alongside older bands and where um, tr traditions and stories can be continued and passed down and the younger people can learn, but also the audiences are part of this and it creates a, a very um, strong environment. Um, so this is more for a home audience. And then you've got other bands such as Yotu Yindi, for example, who've um, um, are much more, um, they're, they're a home band and they play for their own audiences, but they've become um, a representative band for the younger people, for example, up in North, um, in Northern Territory in Australia. And, and that means that people from around the world see this and then think, oh, what's, what is this band about? What is this culture about? Um, 
it's oversimplified a little bit, but I think that it really will depend on what people need and maybe also having networks like people like you, people um, who, who then can spread the word as well um, to try and get the music out there. And um, what I'm trying to do here um, on a very small scale, for example, is I live in a city which is very British, very, you know, there's not a lot of diversity around here. Uh, there's not a lot of awareness of the world. Um, so what I do is I program music that comes from around the world. I've actually programmed the Nepalese band, uh, Namlo, um, a couple of years ago, yeah. Um, and and so what was what was amazing was that we had a very British audience, but we also had a small portion of the Nepalese um, community from Lincoln come out and listen to the concert, which I didn't even know existed in Lincoln. So that was that was fascinating. But also it means that the people who don't know about Nepalese music and who came maybe opened their minds a little bit and were next time they hear about Nepal will have something else to think about rather than what's on the news but they'll think about the music that they've heard and the, this beautiful um, cultural form that they've heard. I don't know if this really answers the questions. I, I don't I don't really want to give advice. I think I, I think everybody will have a different way of doing it but I think the main thing is transmitting the music and the stories. Kesendra, uh, how many musical instruments uh, do you play uh, personally? Well, it, of types, I play three. But um, then I have a lot of different ones. Like just, just now here, I've got like quite a, you know, quite a few. But this is just a small part of the collection. Um, yeah, so quite a few, but they're all recorders or bagpipes. As we are talking about the music and uh, you yourself is a musician, uh, rather than talking too much, uh, I don't want to miss this opportunity to listen uh, other musical instruments, if you don't mind to play, uh, please. So the next one, um, I so as I said, I did my PhD in Mallorca, and I'm going to play a little tune from Mallorca um, on this recorder, which is... Um, it has. It looks like it's got lots of holes, but it doesn't. It's because there was a mistake, and they've re they closed it and reopened the hole because the sound was very good. Um, so this is made out of cane, cane reed. Uh, Arundo Donax is the name of the cane, and um, yeah, it's just a very traditional shepherd's flute. So I'm going to play What of this Um which is another three four tune, but a little bit different. Thank you, uh, Kesendra, for playing amazing music. Uh, could you tell us a, a bit about the music that you recently played? Um, and uh, while listening to uh, the music you played, I sensed that it is for dancing. Or is it uh, also connected with any community or a specific uh, celebration or events? Yeah, so this music will be played on the island of Mallorca, um, which is um, off the western coast of uh, Spain. And this music will be played, this specific piece will be played for dancing. And um, so it will be played at celebrations. And um, this one is from a specific village and is 
um, the, the title refers to the month of September when all the grapes are out and the wine is being made, and so that's, that's this tune. Um, but in the Yoga music is really interesting because the traditional music is used in different ways, but it's often used in moments that are extraordinary, which means that it's not everyday life. Um, it means that it's just... So, um, yeah, this will be played at different celebrations, different festivities, but m music in Mallorca is something that's extraordinary, traditional music. It, it doesn't happen just in a session in a pub like that. It will happen for a specific occasion, um, so for a specific celebration, and especially bagpipes over there will be played for specific moments of the year. Um, so you, you can't just go there and just hear traditional music happen like that it's not like an island where you can maybe walk in a pub and someone will be playing that that doesn't happen so it's yeah it's, it's very specific the other thing that they do in Mallorca is that they play for formal events so um, if the municipality or the government or there's some kind of event happening religious event happening as well then traditional music will be played at that point as well um, in very specific um, forms let's say uh, this piece will mainly be for dancing and for entertainment and um, just for fun. Um, and this will also happen after a celebration that's um, every year on the same date and, and these elements. I would like to listen another tune of music instrument if you don't mind to play uh, and uh, tell the story of, of the music uh, you play. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've got one other instrument with me here. Um, so this is actually a classical music instrument um, in the sense that it's a recorder from the 17th century. Um, but what I play on it very often is Swedish music because it, I think it fits quite well. And so the tune that I've chosen today um, is a Swedish tune and it's a very beautiful story. In Sweden there are lots and lots of forests and there's lots and lots of lakes. Um, and they, one day there was a man who was walking in the forest and he looked down to the river and he saw a very, very beautiful woman. And um, he continued looking at this woman and um, at some point the woman comes out of the river and goes into the forest and just before getting into the forest, she around and disappears. And then he realises uh, when she disappears that he's in the middle of the river with water up to here and um, that he's just seen a water nymph and usually what happens is that they drown the people but he didn't drown this day so he came out of the river and he went home and he wrote this tune
Kesendra, we are almost at the end of the show. Uh, if you have any other musical instrument, uh, it would be interesting if we could listen a bit of a classical instrument that you learned and you played throughout the journey of life uh, that you said earlier. Do you know what? Yeah. I might just improvise something. Okay. At a very, very last of the program, um, I would like to request you to give a one-line message to the world's music lovers about the music. Uh, you know, uh, Cassandra, if you don't mind. Don't stop playing it. I think that's the main thing. Don't stop playing it. We've, it's been really difficult over the last year and a half um, with everything closing down, people um, Sometimes even stopping being musician, uh, taking the drops, but it doesn't matter. Um, even when you can continue playing music, because that's what keeps us alive, that's what keeps us going, and that's what keeps the stories alive as well when we share them. So I would say, don't stop playing. Continue playing and sharing and transmitting the music. Thank you so much, Cassandra, for your time and esteemed thought uh, you shared with the Indigenous Television. Don't stop playing it. And today uh, I have uh, come to the end of the show um, and uh, in, in today's uh, special uh, program I have uh, I had invited a guest uh, from France, uh, the well-known musician currently teaching uh, music at the university in the UK uh, and I discussed about the music and its role in the society. Uh, if you have any questions in regards to a program, you can reach me at indigenoustelevision at gmail.com. Next week, I will uh, come up with a new guest to discuss a new topic. Till then, have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Namaste.